stand in awe of you. You're beautiful. I stand in awe of you. You're beautiful. I stand in awe of you. You're beautiful. Father, this morning we stand in all of you. We reflect the very words of the Apostle Paul that said, I has not seen and ear has not heard, nor has it entered into the heart of man what you will do for those that love you. Father, I ask God that you would just enlarge the fabric of our minds. Magnify yourself in us. It's not that you're making yourself bigger, you're making the image that we hold in our minds bigger. Father, I just sense all over this auditorium, God, you're stretching your people to believe at a greater capacity. You're taking them to a place, God, where they begin to believe you for the more. That they're not going to settle any longer just for the status quo, but they're going to press in to grab hold of your word, to grab hold of your promises, to grab hold of your power. To allow the fullness of who you are to manifest in their lives and in the lives of those around them. Holy Ghost, we just ask that you move in and out of these rows, up and down these aisles. Begin to place your mark. Begin to cause hunger to rise up inside of the hearts of your people may be like Jeremiah that declared and decreed that he had fire shut up in his bones. A fire that was not able to be put out. A fire that consumed everything around him. A fire that enabled him to believe you for the more. We love you today, Father. Give three or four people around you a handshake, high five, elbow bump, whatever you feel comfortable with. All right, now everybody, find yourself a seat. Don't forget, we got folks wait, not, they're waiting for us online. They're like, golly, what's going on? You know, this is a place where the people just love the presence of God. Listen, I want to be able to start off by thanking David and Teresa Jones, as well as this Lifeway family, for your act of love that you showed this past weekend at the conference that we did down in Crawfordville. I'm going to tell you something. I was so proud to be able to see everybody step into action and be used by God to be able to um, cause such a strong regional presence to be able to happen. If you were not at one of those conferences, I'll shoot a link out um, on how you can watch them online. It was just powerful. There's something about when you get hundreds of people that are hungry for the move of God, for the presence of God, that show up, they begin to place a demand upon God. Well, some of you know, some of you don't know, you just think that pastor's been slacking, but we just got back from Israel. I flew in on Sunday um, evening, got in here about 8 o'clock and crawled into bed about 11 o'clock, and it was, it was great. And, you know, we believed God for many suddenlies to be able to happen. And, and listen, I could go the rest of the morning just talking about the suddenlies that God did in Israel and the unexpected. But, you know, for me, I had one in particular that some of you may be aware, if you follow me online, some of you may not be aware. 
but I had a suddenly that I believe is going to stick with me for the rest of my life. You see, we had just got into Tiberias, and we did a little touring while we were there, and we went to the city of Magdala. Some of you have been to Magdala, some of you have not, some of you read about Magdala, but it was, where, it was there that Mary Magdalene had demonic spirits cast out of her. But it was also there that a woman who had exhausted all of her resources, that had gone to every physician that she knew, that had a, a hemorrhaging, had a blood flow that she could not cure herself. And the Bible says that she got to a point to where she just determined inside of her heart that she was going to reach out and touch God. And the Bible says that she pressed through the crowd. You need to understand something by her pressing through the crowd that literally put her in a position where she could have been stoned because she was unclean. And because she was unclean, she was not able to be able to um, be in close proximity to people that are around her. But you know, sometimes when you're desperate, you'll do desperate things. Turn to your neighbor and say, you're sitting next to one of them today. If you don't watch it, you know, I might step on your toes to be able to stand up to shout to be able to tell God that he is good. And so all of a sudden, you know, she pressed through the crowd. And you know the story. All of a sudden, Jesus turned and he said, who touched me? And the disciples were like, what are you talking about? Everybody's touching you. The whole crowd is pressing in around you. And he said, no, somebody touched me with intent. And all of a sudden, healing virtue went out of her. So we came into Tiberias, and that night I had, um, um, we, we got into our hotel room there on the, on the Sea of Galilee. And we got all settled in. We had dinner together, and we all went to our rooms for a good night's rest. And about 1.30 in the morning, my phone rang. Now, some of you are aware that my mother has been battling with um, no kidney function for about three months. That she went through um, a, a bout that weren't sure if it was medicated related, medication related, or whatever it was, but she had zero um, kidney function. Her creatine level was through the roof. Her nephrologist told her that your kidneys will never come back. You're 87 years old. They've lived a good, healthy life, but they ain't coming back. And I told her, I said, Mama, don't you give up on God. And so all of a sudden, my phone rang at 1.30 in the morning, and she's screaming on the other end, telling me that she's healed. Amen. Telling me that she went for dialysis that night, and they did blood, they, you know, they always took blood to be able to see what her creatine levels were, and they said, Miss Barbara, you don't need to come here anymore. She's like, well, what do you mean? You want me to come back on Saturday? She says, no, you don't need to come here anymore. Your, your kidneys are working perfectly. I'll never forget that. I'll never forget that moment. And you know what? And listen to me, that's my mama's testimony, but now it's become my testimony. And I pray that not only becomes my testimony, but you begin to learn the power of the circle and all of a sudden now testimony. That you begin to tell other people what God has done. You know what that does is contagious. That's why Revelation said they overcame by the blood of the Lamb and by what? The word of their testimony. And all of a sudden when you begin to testify about the goodness of God, it does something on the inside of you. It causes your DNA to begin to align with God's DNA. It causes your belief, belief systems to begin to believe God for the more. And as you begin to believe God for the more, He begins to supernaturally move on your behalf. Let me say something to you. He's no respecter of persons. And I wish I could tell you that my mama did something great. I wish I could tell you that she gave $100,000 to the church and, and God just said, well, I better give her something because she gave me a lot. No, it, it was none of that. She did nothing out of the ordinary. You see, what, what happens sometimes is we fall into these religious circles and we think that we've got to be able to jump through hoops like a, a circus dog in order to be able to get God's love and get his attention. I'm just telling you right now, someone needs to be able to hear this. He already loves you. He loves you with an everlasting love, and there ain't nothing that you're going to be able to do to be able to earn his love. There's nothing that you're going to be able to give to cause him to love you more. There's no sacrifice that you can make that's going to be able to stop him from doing what he does, because you see, he's love. And his love is not based on our performance. But I'm here to tell you something, that God completely rocked me on this trip. And what I love is that, you know, we believe God for the exceedingly abundantly. And, and any time we believe God, he begins to move. You know what happens sometimes is that we pray and we forget about the prayers that we pray. God moves and what happens, we don't recognize his hand. And his hand's happening all around us. But when we begin to see his hand move, there's something about choosing to rejoice in the Lord always. Not just through the big times, not just through the healing of Pastor Eli's mama, but I'm talking about all times. When you have a disposition every single day that you're going to choose to be able to rejoice in the Lord always. So when you get up in the morning, you thank God that you have life. You thank God that you have breath. You thank God that you're able to start throughout the course of the day. And you thank God in all things. When you begin to thank God in all things, he begins to move in all things. And as he begins to move in all things, some of the things that you're believing God for, he begins to move on your behalf. But I don't know about you, sometimes your pastor has not always found himself being thankful in all things. 
Sometimes your pastor can get into a little, little bit of the um, doldrums and next thing you know, he's complaining a little bit and don't like this and don't like that. Am I talking to anybody? Do I got anybody else in the house? Oh, I got all these super saints inside this house that, you know what, they ain't never complained about nothing. You know what, they got it all going on. But the fact of the matter is, is that, you know what, we all can fall victim to that. Why? Because the enemy's so quick to be able to come and get us to be able to focus on what we don't have instead of rejoicing on what we do have. Amen. Well, praise the Lord. Somebody turned and said, man, I don't know what he's preaching on today, but he's preaching. I got something on the inside of me. How many of you know that the book of Ecclesiastes says there's times and seasons for everything under the heavens? For everything under the heavens. You know, we're in a season right now of just the supernatural. You know, we, we, we flew out on Thursday morning at about 1 o'clock in the morning. I got home last night when we landed at 8 p.m. I think that, you know, it had been 44 hours since I slept in a bed. Slept. You haven't slept in two days? Oh, praise the Lord. Listen, 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 listen. That went, no, it was everything holy in your pastor. He didn't shower for two days. Listen, I stunk. My goodness, I stunk. I told my wife, I said, I don't know what's wrong with that deodorant, but you know what? We're throwing it in the garbage because it ain't working. It, it ain't giving you that. It won't even give 12-hour protection, let alone 48-hour protection. But you know what's so beautiful is that through it all, we had suddenly all the way at the very end. Here we are sleep deprived. We've got like a... Three-day layover in Miami. No, it went three days, but it was a long time. All I know is that we flew in there about 10 o'clock in the morning. Our flight didn't leave at 6.30 at night. Next thing I know, some of our ladies turned and said, you know, hey, we're going to go for a walk. You know what that means? They're going shopping. And, and so they, they're going for a walk. Next thing I know, they come back with a woman who had been struggling, trying to get to her gate. And, you know, they sat her down next to me. They said, we need to pray for her. And so, you know what we prayed for? And then they all grabbed her bags, and they helped her get to the gate. So even in the midst of their, of their sleep depravity, they were having suddenlies. You know what? Because God always wants to bring people into our path that we can be, bring forth the kingdom of God and bring forth the greatness of who he is. Amen? Turn to your neighbor and say, there's a season for everything. Get ready. So we flew out on Thursday morning, but on Wednesday night at sundown, we're on the southern steps, second chapter of Acts. That's where the, the Holy Spirit fell upon the, the disciples in the upper room. And the Bible says that they spilled out into the streets. Theologians will tell you they spilled out onto the southern steps. And that's where Peter gave a great sermon, you know, 13-minute sermon. So don't complain about me being short on my sermons because his, his sermon was only about 13 minutes. And he won 3,000 people to the Lord. Sometimes we feel like we got to be long-winded in order to get God's attention. Listen, Peter just got up and he just told about the Lord. 13 minutes later, they had 3,000 people saved, filled with the Holy Ghost, baptized in mikvahs right there on the southern steps. So we turn and here we're closing out the day and, and all of a sudden Jane turns and says, Pastor, it's, it's getting ready to start Purim. We need to be able to pray for Israel and pray for the city of Jerusalem. And all of a sudden we turned and we prayed for, for, for um, Israel and we prayed for the city of Jerusalem because you know what God says to be able to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. God says that he will bless those who bless Israel. And I don't know about you, but I want to be a blessed person. I, I want to be blessed coming in and going out. I want to be blessed in the city and in the field. I don't go in the field very much because I'm a country city boy. But when I do go in the field, I want to be blessed in the field. So if I go hunting, I want to kill something. And so all of a sudden, he turned and he said, you know what? You're going to be blessed if you bless Israel. So we've turned and we began to pray for Israel. And all of a sudden, in the midst of it, everything began to shift. And we had our, our Israeli guide, a young man that's been connected with me for minimum five years. And it's just amazing what God's doing inside of his life. You know what I love is that sometimes guides, they feel like they know it all. And you know what? This young man, he was constantly, he was always listening. Sometimes, you know what? I got pages of notes of stuff that he said that I was like, man, I didn't know that. And all of a sudden, now I've got areas that I'm growing in. But next thing I know, I start praying for him. And I start praying for God's blessing upon his life. Start praying that the windows of heaven would begin to open up. And you know what? This man broke. He broke. He, he cried like I don't think I've ever heard a grown man cry before. And he broke. Because you know what? God wants us to expect suddenlies. He wants us to be able to be that, that ever-present help in people's time of need. And when we can turn and recognize that there is a time and a season for everything under the heavens, then God enables us to be used by him. What would take place if this group of people decided tomorrow morning when you get up that you're going to be used by God today? To where every place that you went, every step that you took, you were looking for opportunities to be able to bless somebody. You were looking for opportunities to give somebody a prophetic word. Maybe to tell somebody about the goodness and the greatness of God. You know what would take place is that you would lean in continually. I got a piece of paper in my pocket. And you know what? And every time I'm reaching in my pocket and I'm feeling that paper, it's reminding me what's on it. You know what's on it? Money. But 
but it ain't the kind of money you think. This is a different kind of money. These are people that are going to go to Israel with me. But you know, the beautiful thing about it is this, is that it gives me a constant reminder of something in my pocket. But what would happen if all of a sudden inside of your pocket, you had a reminder? And that reminder was today, God wants to be able to use me. Today, God's going to be able to use me in ways that I can't even begin to imagine. Well, every time you slipped your finger in your pocket, you would feel it. And all of a sudden, your radar antennas would go up and you say, okay, God, who is it that you want to have an encounter with you? You see, that's how the disciples were. So here we're, we're in a season to where there is times and seasons for everything under the heavens. So here we're kicking off Purim on Wednesday night. I just want to talk a little bit about it because we're in a supernatural season right now. I want to raise your level of expectation. Listen to me. I know some of you are thinking, Purim, wait a minute. Whoa, 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 hold back up. We are Christians. And this brother's talking about a Jewish holiday? How many of you know that our Lord and Savior was Jewish? How many of you know that he celebrated all the feasts? How many of you know that the feast didn't glorify man, but the feast glorified God? And all of a sudden, when you turn and you look at the feast, you see the supernatural power of God that's moving inside of our lives. And when you can embrace the supernatural power of God, it's not a a testimony just for the Jewish culture, but it's a testimony for the kingdom of God. And you begin to recognize that God's no respecter. What he did back for Queen Esther, he can do for us as well. Amen? So if you've got your Bibles out, will you turn to the book of Esther? You know, one of the things that I want to recognize to you today is that every one of us, we fight battles. You know, how many of you have ever read the Passion Translation? You know, I love Ephesians chapter 12 where it says that we wrestle not against flesh and blood. But let me read it to you from the Passion Translation. Ephesians 6, 12, it says, your hand-to-hand combat is not with human beings. Turn to your neighbor and say, you are not my enemy. Turn to your other neighbor and say, you're not my enemy either. My enemy is the enemy in me. Oh, I ain't hear nobody talk. Listen, I done flipped the table on you. You ain't want to be able to recognize that. How many of you know that the greatest battles we'll ever fight are not the battles on foreign lands or foreign soils? The greatest battles we'll ever fight are right here inside of our heart to our head. You know, God tells us something. What's the first thing that happens? Oh, I don't believe that. Or all of a sudden, I don't know if that's for me. You know what's happening? You're fighting the enemy in me. And the enemy's trying to lie to you to be able to take something from you that is yours. So he goes on to be able to say, your hand-to-hand combat is not with human beings, but with the highest principalities and authorities operating in rebellion under the heavenly realms. For they are powerful classes of, of demon gods and evil spirits that hold this dark world in bondage. You know, I told you last week that the devil is not God's adversary. God has no adversaries. There is no worthy foe that's out there that can stand toe-to-toe with him. There was a a time in heaven where all of a sudden Lucifer had a thought. And you know what that thought did? Jesus said, I saw Satan fall like lightning to the the earth. All of a sudden, there is no, no, no worthy opponent that can stand in the presence of God. But here in this world, we do have an opponent. And that opponent wants to stop us from reaching the fullness of what God has in store for our lives. So let's get back to Purim. So Purim literally means in, um, in the, the, root, 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 the root word for Pur means lots. Lots were cast to determine the destruction of the Jews. So what they did was they rolled these lots or they rolled these dice to determine a time that they were going to destroy the Jewish people. And, you know, and so let me just give you a little bit of a, a narration. So, you know, the, the, the king of Persia had a, um, um, a queen and her queen was, his queen was not real obedient. So he turned and he said, guess what? You're no longer my queen. So he kicked her out. So he turned and he said, I want all the beautiful girls in the land, all the virgins to be brought. And, and, you know, and they're going to go through a beauty contest. And they went through a beauty contest. And the Bible says that a girl by the name of Hadassah, which is her original Hebrew name, her pagan name is Esther, goes through a process of a year of preparation for one night with the king. And the Bible says she was beautiful. The Bible says that she touched the heart of the king and she was the king's favorite. To where the king turned and he made her queen. So all of a sudden there are three main characters inside of these scriptures. There is an evil man by the name of Haman. Say, ooh. You know what's so beautiful about Purim? Purim is kind of like our Halloween except they don't worship the devil. In, 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 In Israel, Purim, you know what they do? They all dress up in costumes. 
So it's a time of, of festivities. Why? Because they're going to make fun of Haman because God flipped the script on them. So it was awesome. And, you know, and we have a tendency to be able to celebrate one day. Well, them Jews, they learned how to be able to celebrate. And now they've got a whole week festival. So anywhere we went, we saw these little kids all dressed up in costumes. And you know what was amazing to me? I never knew that Spider-Man and, and was, was, in, it was in the Bible, but I saw the little kids dressed up like Spider-Man. Uh, I saw them dressed up like all kinds of superheroes because they didn't care. But, you know, it was a time of great um, festivities. It was a time of great reflection. You know, we're not real good on, on, on giving correct biblical history. But the Israelites, the, the Jews, they recognize that they've got to keep that before their people. So they constantly tell their, their, their children about what went on. So all of a sudden we find that here she goes before the king. And, and you know, and there's a, an evil man by the name of Haman. Turn to your neighbor and say, ooh. And then there is a, um, a godly man by the name of Mordecai who has a niece by the name of Esther. And so Mordecai, he sits by the gate, and so he's, that's where all of the, 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 the legal um, jurisdictions would take place. That's where if people had situations, they would come to the gate, they would begin to talk to the leaders of that city, and they would make rulings on their behalf. But Haman did not like Mordecai. Now, some of it was because Mordecai chose not to be able to bow to Haman. He didn't recognize his authority. Um, but you know what? We recognize that, that there is a, um, a, a spiritual battle that goes on. That's what Ephesians says. So inside of this scripture, we have main characters. We have the king, which is very symbolic of our father God. We have Haman, and you know who he's symbolic of. And all of a sudden now we've got Mordecai, who's very symbolic of the Holy Spirit. And we've got Esther, who's very symbolic of the church, the ecclesia. So as a result, you know, here Mordecai, he finds out about a plot that, um, that, that Haman has to be able to exterminate the Jews. And he comes before um, um, his niece, sends a message to his niece, and tells his niece to be able to get an audience with the king, to be able to tell the king about this plot, because this plot was to be able to exterminate the Jews. But, you know, the king didn't know that Esther was Jewish. Haman didn't know that Esther was Jewish. So all of a sudden, you know, at first she is not willing to be able to do that because she just can't bebop into the king's presence and be able to say, hey, good looking, what's going on? I just wanted to come and see you today. She could not go into his presence unless she was summonsed. And so all of a sudden, Haman sends her back another message and tells her, says, listen, if you choose not to be able to do this, don't think you're going to be able to hide from this decree because the decree was that all Jewish people would be killed. And don't think that God would not raise up somebody else to be able to bring salvation to the Jews. So she turns to Haman and she says, listen, I want everybody to be able to pray for I mean, pray and fast for three days. I don't want them to drink anything. I don't want them to eat anything. And she's going to go before the king. So she goes before the king and, um, and, and, and the king sees her out in the outer court. And he's thinking, oh yeah, that's my girl. Come on, come on in. And when she comes in, he extends the scepter to her. Well, that scepter is a position of authority. And he says, you know, Esther, what is it that I can do for you? Whatever you ask up to a half of the kingdom, I will give to you. And he extends this scepter to her for her to be able to touch that scepter. So once she touched that scepter, anything that he promised was written in stone. And so she turns, and at that point, she's not going to be able to let him know what her promise is. She just said, hey, listen, I want to hold a special dinner tonight, a banquet for you and for Haman. Why don't you come and let us celebrate together. And so the king's thinking, okay. So he goes, and Haman, he's very excited because now he's going to a banquet, not for all the dignitaries. He's going for a banquet just for him, the king, and the queen. And so he goes before the king, and um, they have that banquet. And so all of a sudden, the king turns to her again and says, Esther, what is it that I can do for you? And she says, you know, king, if you'll just oblige me and come back again tomorrow night, let's do another banquet. So he comes back tomorrow night, and here Haman, he's already prepared. He's got the gallows all built, 75 feet tall, to be able to kill Mordecai and to kill all of the Jews. And so that night, before they come together, all of a sudden the king can't sleep. Turn your neighbor and say, the king can't sleep. And he's walking the halls, and as he's walking the halls, they've got a book of remembrance. And there was a situation that took place to where it was a plot to be able to kill the king. And all of a sudden, Mordecai overheard the plot to kill the king. And he turned and, and exposed that plot. And they found, they tried the guys that were trying to be able to kill the king. They found them guilty. And they, and they hung them. 
And so now here it is, the night before, they're getting ready to go for the second night of the banquet. The king's walking the halls because he can't sleep. Turn to your neighbor and say, he can't sleep. You know, sometimes you can't sleep and you want to sit there and think you got insomnia where God just wants you to get up and walk the halls. Maybe there's some things that he wants you to be able to pray about. Maybe there's some things he wants to reveal to you. I learned a long time ago, I can stay in that bed and just toss and turn all night long, or I can get up and get some things done. So he gets up and he begins to get to this book of remembrance. And so he's flipping through this book of remembrance and he's thinking, what did we do for this guy Mordecai? And one of the eunuchs turned to him and said, we didn't do nothing for him. This guy unfoiled a plot to be able to kill me and we did nothing for him. So before the banquet, he turns to Haman and he calls Haman in and he said, Haman, what should we do for somebody that we want to be able to show honor to? And all of a sudden, Haman's thinking, man, I'm already having dinner tonight with just the king and the queen. You know, I'm the prime minister. And all of a sudden, God's going to be, this guy's going to be able to honor me. So he just, he just, just peels back the layers. He turns and says, well, I think that, you know what, you need to put a robe on this guy, a robe that you wear. You need to be able to put a crown upon his head. You need to be able to let him ride one of your horses. And you need to be able to have him paraded throughout the city with one of your nobles so that they can see that this guy is very special. And he turns and he says, okay, do this for Mordecai. And I only could imagine, oh, Haman, boy, just the blood just drained from his face. Here, he's plotting to be able to kill this guy. Now, all of a sudden, God says to be able to honor him. So he has to be able to honor him. And he takes him through the streets. So now it's time for the second night banquet. And all of a sudden, they come. And so now the king wants to know from Esther, okay, now all this delay is about over now. This is the second night I've been asked you. This is my third time I'm going to ask you, you know, what is it that you want up to a third of the kingdom? And all of a sudden, she turns and she unfoils the plot. She says, king, there's a threat against me and my people. And he's like, what? Who's trying to be able to hurt my queen? And she turns and says, that wicked Haman. He's trying to be able to exterminate me and my people. Well, the king gets up and he's just enraged. He he leaves the room. And all of a sudden, you know, Haman, he's already had his face drained from from blood once because of Mordecai. Now he's got a second draining. And he turns and he's just like, man, what is going on? And, And he starts begging Esther, please have mercy on me. I am so sorry. I will not do this. Please have mercy on me. And he throws himself against her lap to be able to tell her that he is sorry. And in comes the king. And he turns and he says, man, what is this? You know, here, all of a sudden, you're going to try to be able to, to kill my queen and, my, and her people, and now you're going to try to uh, attack my queen? And he turns, and that's when the eunuch says, oh, by the way, king, he done got these, these gallows built that are 75 feet tall. And he turns and says, well, you take Haman right now, and you hang him on his own gallows. And not just Haman, but you hang all 10 of his children on those, on those gallows. You see, we need to understand something. We're in a season, I don't know where I'm at on these notes. We're in, a, we're in a season where all of a sudden God is wanting to be able to do some things. You know, you know what's amazing is that here um, inside of this story, we see a tremendous reversal. We see a reversal that does not happen at the very beginning of time. It happens at the very last moment. We see a reversal to where God is moving behind the scenes. How many of you have ever felt like that God is not moving on your behalf? Everybody better raise your hand. I'm going to call you out. Every one of us at times have felt like we've prayed and God has not heard what we've prayed. Every one of us have felt like, that. you know what, God will do it for the pastor's mama, but he ain't going to do it for me. Every one of us have felt those things. But what we don't realize is that God is always working, even though sometimes we can't see him. I'm sure Mordecai, he was out there shaking like a leaf on a tree, not knowing if this thing was going to happen or if those gallows that they built, he was going to be able to hang his neck. But all of a sudden, God calls the king one night not to be able to sleep. Gave him insomnia. Got him up walking, walking the streets, walking, walking the, 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 the aisles of, of his palace, only for him to be able to begin to show him some things. You see, we have to understand something, that Purim is a time of a supernatural turnaround. But it's a time for us to be able to remember the faithfulness of God. You know how many times God's name is mentioned in the book of Esther? None. Zero. But we see God all throughout it. We see God, we see people that chose to be able to pray. Don't worry about him, that's my grandson, and he can say whatever he wants. <laughs> so all of a sudden what happens is that we see people that prayed to God. We see people that fasted. We saw people that believed God for supernatural turnarounds, even though they're not mentioning his name. 
You see, sometimes he's the unnamed God, the unmentioned God. And sometimes we can't see his hand. We can't trace his heart in the midst of what's happening inside of our lives. But we've got to learn to trust him even when we cannot track him. We've got to recognize he's moving on our behalf. I, I, I don't know why I said this earlier, but God wants us to be people that rejoice in him always. That we never give up our joy, we never give up our faith, we never give up our ability. We always choose to rejoice in him, recognizing that he's the God of the turnaround. He's the God of the boomerang. He's the God that can take the things that seem like they, that they're not and cause them to be able to be called as if they are. He's a God that's able to do everything that we can hope for or imagine. But sometimes our greatest failures lie at the door of our greatest assumptions. Sometimes we assume that God's not going to do it. And all of a sudden we allow those assumptions to settle into our core. Now all of a sudden we've got the spirit of the living God down on the inside of us. You know, the Bible says that from your belly will flow rivers, plural, of living water. And so you've got the Spirit of God on the inside of you that knows who you are, has known who you are since the foundation of the world, has, has known that you are in Christ and has a purpose for your life, just like Jeremiah from the foundation of the world. But now all of a sudden you've got this battle inside of your mind trying to tell you that you're not what everybody else says you are. You're not what the prophetic word is for your life. You're not what the Bible says that you are. And all of a sudden you've got this battle that's raging on the inside. But we've got to come to a place where we choose to give in to what God said. We choose to allow God to be able to exceed all of our expectations. You know what's amazing is that the man with the microphone today has come into a, a season to where I'm just believing God for the crazy things. I'm believing him to exceed, you know, all of a sudden, you know, two months before we went to Israel, I didn't even know, I'll be honest with you, I'll tell the truth and shame the devil. I never even knew when we switched our date to go to Israel that Purim was going to fall on it. All I knew is that God told me to be able to believe him for the suddenlies. And you know what? And so one day while we were all together, everybody was getting ready to have lunch. They swept me away to go have lunch with the president of the, of the tour company that we go to Israel with. It's one of the largest tour companies. They have offices in the United States as well as, as Israel. So I'm sitting at lunch with a man that owns it all. And all of a sudden he turns and, he's, and we're talking about upcoming tours and he's telling me how much he really appreciates what's happening. He says, man, I understand you've written a book. And I said, yeah, I have. And I said, you know, it's kind of blowing me away what's happening. He said, well, what do you mean what's happening? And, and his partner is the one, see that on top of the book, it says returning to the roots of our faith. First time I ever met his partner, who's an Orthodox Jew, turned to me and said, um, what is this right here, returning to the roots of your faith? I said, well, you know, Christianity is all birthed in Judaism. And so our goal is to be able to help raise the awareness from the side of the Christian community to understand what their root systems are. To understand when Jesus said certain things, why he said it, because of the culture of the land and because of, of the culture of Judaism. And he says, yeah, I understand that. And he said, but... This returning to the roots of your faith, what is that? And I said, it's helping Christians understand the roots of their faith. And he says, no, I get all that. He said, where did you get that slogan from? I said, that's the heartbeat that I have to be able to help Christians return to the roots of your faith. He says, no. He said, this is our slogan. And he said, it's not on any printed material that we have. He said, my heart, my passion is to help Jews return to the roots of, your, of their faith. And I turned to him. I said, I, I, I don't know. I, I, I didn't see any print material. I didn't know that that was your slogan. Nobody ever told me that. I said, but obviously we have a kindred spirit. Obviously we want to see people grow in their faith towards God. And, um, and, and so now I'm sitting with his other partner. And his other partner said, tell me about this book. And he said, you know, I've got people all over Israel that are talking about your book. He's got tour guides that have been guiding for 50 years. That are turned to him and say, that man's writing stuff that I've never heard before. And as I began to research it, I realized that it's true. I had one guy send me an instant message. And he said, man, when you wrote about healing in, in, in the wings of Jesus from Malachi chapter 4, he said, I have taught that. I know that's true. But I go to my Hebrew Bible and there's no Malachi chapter 4. It's been removed. And I was like, ooh. And he said, not only that, but Isaiah 53 that talks about the suffering servant has been removed. So now the president... The owner of this company turns and says, what does it cost you to be able to print these books? I said, man, they're about $20 a piece. And he turned and he said, you will never again incur that expense. He said, our company will, will pay for every book that you have printed. And he said, I'm going to talk to my partner. And we may have every person that comes to Israel, whether they're with you or not, get a copy of your book. Thank you, thank you, thank you. That's my testimony. 
Where is your testimony? What do you believe in God to be able to do? What is the more that he wants to do inside of your life? Let me say something to you. Don't despise the days of small beginnings. When I started this thing, I started it as a reference for me. So I could remember the things that I was, I was learning for the very first time. I began to write this thing so that I would retain the truth of God's word. Never knowing that God was going to use that one day to be able to help other people draw closer to him. You see, every one of us have gifts. God has given us those gifts. And those gifts are there for a specific reason, for a, spe for a specific purpose. But if we don't ever take time to believe God for the more, if all we ever do is just sit back and, and live our lives by the status quo, you know what will take place? That's all we'll ever get. Because we have no faith there. We have no expectation. You know, we've got to come to a place where we've got to begin to believe God for the exceedingly abundantly, above and beyond whatever we can hope for or imagine. You know, this, this whole series about it's time for change. Remember I told you our, our mind has two primary functions. The one function is, is to be able to, to live inside of a closet of remembrance. And it's really the size of a closet. But, but God has given us the ability to imagine him to do the exceedingly abundantly. And that part of our brain, the imagination, is as large as the universe. And when we choose to live our lives imagining God to do great things inside of our lives, inside of our community, inside of our, our region, inside of our state, inside of our nation, inside of our world, you know what happens? We unlock the windows of heaven and we give God an opportunity to begin to move. But we've got to be people that begin to believe him for the more. Purim is a festival to where God began to show that he will exceed all of our expectations in all of our hopes or imaginations. So here all of a sudden, you know, here Haman has his ten sons that are killed on Purim, hung. Do you know that Adolf Hitler, who persecuted the Jews, had ten generals that were, that were, that were um, um, tried and found guilty of war crimes against them? Do you, do you realize that Joseph Stalin who was very anti-Semitic, was getting ready to be able to exterminate the Jews on the holy festival of Purim. And the night before he gave the order to have them exterminated, he had a stroke and he died. In 1991, Saddam Hussein was trying to annihilate Israel by launching Scud missiles. When did those missiles stop? On Purim. Because God is one that will always come to the defense of his children. There's something about believing God for the exceedingly abundantly. There's something about believing God to be able to exceed all of our hopes or our imaginations. But here's where I want to be able to close in today. Come and help me, Josh. So here all of a sudden, in Esther 9.25, the Bible says that, but when Queen Esther intervened with the king, he gave written orders that the evil scheme that Haman had worked out should return or boomerang back on his head. Let me say something to you. The enemy wants to keep us distracted. He wants us to be able to focus sometimes on our adversaries. Even though we know that we don't war against flesh and blood, sometimes we have to deal with some flesh and blood. But I'm just telling you that we're in a season right now of the supernatural. We're in a season right now that if we'll begin to believe God for the more, even the attacks that have been launched against us, God will cause those attacks to be able to boomerang back on the people that tried to launch them or upon the spirits that are trying to be able to stop you. You see, God orchestrates events. He orchestrates timings. He chose a queen from the nation of Israel a Jewish girl by the name of Hadassah to catch the fancy of a king because before an evil plot could even be launched God already knew it was coming remember I told you that God is the Alpha and the Omega everything in between the Bible says that he knew us from the foundation of the world he goes to the end of our lives and he works backwards to our now that's why he says all things work together for good because he recognizes even the things inside of our lives that have caused us pain, that have caused us struggle, that if we'll set our eyes upon him, he'll cause all things to work together for our good. He orchestrates sleep patterns, favor for individuals, the uncovering of evil plans. He orchestrates rescues. And our God orchestrates so much more. 
Every one of us could testify of the awesome power of God. Trey, you weren't at the conference this, this past weekend, but Ken Malone used you as an illustration. You know, here Trey's a part of a, a new start roofing company. Start, what, three years, four years, six years? And in the six years, they've had just tremendous favor. And Ken Malone was talking about it at a time over in Satellite Beach. They took major um, damage to their, their roof of, the, of their church because of a hurricane that was sitting off the coast. He called me and he said, listen, do you have any access to roofing supplies? Because everything is sold out here in the Space Coast. I said, yeah, my son-in-law, you know, works in a roofing company, we're roofing business. I said, send me over a supply list. So I sent the supply list to Trey and Trey real quickly within, you know, just a few hours had that supply list pulled. We went and picked it up. We drove it down there, had to have just multiple five gallons of cans of gas in the back of the truck as we pulled it down because they had no electricity. So we knew we couldn't get gas the closer we got. They were very thankful. We pulled in there late one night and unloaded everything and turned back around and came back to Tallahassee. Well, just weeks after, he's sending me phone call after phone call after phone call asking for a bill. And I'm telling Trey, Trey, listen, you know, I need a bill. I need a bill. This guy's wanting to be able to pay this bill. And, um, and Trey just turned and says, there ain't no bill. I could have this number wrong. If I do, I got the microphone, so you need to be quiet, Trey. But I want to say that the next year, he told me they did like $6 million in business in roofs. There's just something about when you just turn, you turn and you direct everything back to God. Now, I'm not telling you that if you call Trey, he's going to give you a free roof. Because he's in the business to be able to pay his bills and, you know, but I'm just telling you, there's, got, there's times in all of our lives that we've got to be able to direct our focus upon God. And there are times where God's going to ask us to be able to do things that are going to stretch us. My wife and I, on a couple of occasions, were stretched by God to be able to empty our entire bank account, all of our savings and everything, to be able to help other families. And you know what? And I turned and I learned that I want to live long on the earth. So I turned, when God spoke to me, I said, God, you're going to speak to my wife. And, and if she doesn't come back with a unanimous yes, we ain't doing it. And all of a sudden, I would turn to her and say, listen, I want you to pray about us helping these families. You know what she did? She came back. She said, Jeff, I think we need to help them. We need to give them all we got. And you know what I realized is that you can't outgive God. Because our Heavenly Father is a good, good Father. And here in the book of Purim, the book of Esther, Purim actually reflects that. He's always working behind the scenes. And, and my whole purpose today is to be able to get you to start thinking differently. To help, help you understand that, that He is the God that will exceed everything that you can hope for or imagine. He's working behind the scenes in ways that you can't even begin to understand. He's right now, some of you under the sound of my voice, He is stirring inside of you to do things. And you're struggling with the... The when, the what, and the how. And he's just saying, take that first step. Just believe me for the more. It doesn't matter what it is. It could be a business transaction. It could be taking a step to repair broken relationships. You see, sometimes the hardest step is the first. Sometimes the hardest words to say is, I'm sorry. But when you begin to believe God and you begin to follow in the patterns of our Savior, it sets the stage for God to begin to move on your behalf. It sets the stage for Him to show Himself strong. It sets the stage for the exceedingly abundantly to come into your life. You know what I recognize is that God's desire is to open the windows of heaven. He's made that crystal clear. That's His desire. You know what keeps the windows closed? Me. Me. The thoughts in my mind, the motives in my heart, my willingness to be able to say yes, or sometimes my disobedience to say no. That's what closes the windows. But when I choose to be able to honor him, honor his word, and honor what he says, the Bible says that he'll open up the windows of heaven. Not only open up the windows of heaven, the Bible says that he will rebuke the devourer on your behalf. You know what the devourer is inside of the Hebrew? It is seed eater. When you leave here today, you're going to be able to tithe. And as you tithe, that is your seed into the ground. Your seed also is your children. Your seed also is your, your, don your donation or your, your, your um, benevolence inside of the community. Whatever it may be, it may not always be what you put into a basket. It may be your life. It may be your gifts. It may be your talents. But the enemy comes, and what does he want to do? He wants to eat that seed up. He wants to stop the effectiveness of it. Because when that seed hits good soil, all of a sudden that seed produces 30, 60, 100 fold. 
So all of a sudden, you give of your gifts, you give of your talents, you give of your resources, you give of your life. And God says, I'm going to take that and give a hundredfold return. You know, they say that you can count the amount of apples on a tree, but you can't count the amount of apples in a seed. There's something about us choosing to be people that trust God to take the seeds of our life and begin to move mightily on their behalf. So we're in a boomerang season. Here, Haman planned an evil plot. God turned it back around. But listen, we're not just in a boomerang season. How many of you know this is a Jewish leap year? Now, for some of us, we don't realize it's a Jewish leap year because it's not an, a, a, a leap year on our calendar. No, leap year happens every four years. But our calendar is not the same as the Hebrew calendar. We're on a Gregorian calendar. Their calendar is on the moon. So this is a Jewish leap year. So you know what happens during a, a Jewish leap year? They take the month of December, but their month is not December. It's Adar. And they don't do just one month of December. They do two. How would you all like that? How would you like to have two Christmases? How would you like to leave your trees up for 60 days? How would you like to be able to have your, your relatives have to go buy you two gifts? That's what I'm saying. But it's a month of Adar. And you know what's so awesome about it? That is that this Jewish leap year is a double Adar. And Adar is connected to the joy of the Lord from, from Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 10, which is our strength. So it's a year of double strength. It's a year of double joy. It's a year of God doubling who he is inside of our lives. It's a year of a double boomerang. It's a year of God opening up the windows of heaven in ways that will blow your mind. Let me get you to stand to your feet. I just want you to grab a hand of somebody that you're next to. If you're not next to anybody, I want you to slide down the aisle a little bit. So yesterday at the conference, something very unique happened. They began to talk about the power of our words. Began to talk about the importance of life and death being in the power of our tongue. Started talking about the importance of blessing versus cursing. Began to talk about the importance of blessing our city, blessing our regions, blessing our state, blessing our nation. How many of you know sometimes you can talk about other people's cities? Sometimes we don't talk real good about them. I've been guilty of that. I've been talking about some states that I thought were a bunch of crazy folks living in them states. Talked about some leaders that I thought, man, them people done lost their, their marbles. I can't believe what they're doing. But you know what was so great about this conference is that they began to talk about the importance of speaking life, life, life. I'll never forget, I got a great brother that ministers in Chicago. And he put a post one day. He said, listen, I know Chicago's got some issues. They're killing people every single weekend. He said, but please be careful of what you say because I'm one of the laborers in this field. And I'm believing God for the supernatural to break forth in Chicago. I'm believing for revival to begin to come. I'm believing that the healing of God would begin to flow through our streets. And so this entire conference, they, all of a sudden things begin to shift. On Friday night, they turned to me and they said, hey, listen, do you got anything? I said, man, I think we need to pray for some cities. We need to be praying for the San Francisco's, the Seattle's, you know, the Washington's, the, 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 the Chicago's. We need to be praying for the Baltimore's, the Philadelphia's, the Atlanta's, the places where all of a sudden the enemy is trying to be able to say, these are our strongholds. And we need to start praying for the mercy of God to begin to flow through those cities. And all of a sudden we did it on Friday night and they, they picked back up on that on Saturday. And all of a sudden they turned and they said, men. The women inside of our churches normally are towing the line. Those are the intercessors. Those are the ones that are out there on the front line. But God's calling men back to manhood. God's calling men back to leadership. God's calling men to be the ones that believe for their families and believe for their cities and believe for their regions and for their nations. And all of a sudden we had, I don't know, we had a lot of men down front. I would say hundreds, but I don't know how many. I, I didn't count because I was down at the altar with my face buried in the carpet. Just asking God, God, break my heart for my city again. Because i got to confess before you that, you know what, there's things inside of my city that I don't, I don't cry over. I don't weep over. And I need to. I, I need to be concerned of the 50,000 students that come to these university systems that for many of them, they fall away from their Christian faith when they come here because of the secular humanism that's pumped into their minds. That needs to break my heart. 
It needs to break my heart when we have lobbyists and or, and, or legislators that come to this city and, and they pass legislation that is not godly. That needs to break my heart. I need to begin crying over that. I need to be crying out to God for that. I need to be crying out for the people every day that choose to be able to step through this life to the next that don't know the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior. That needs to break my heart. And i got to be honest with you, it hasn't been. It hasn't moved me. But all of a sudden, yesterday, I was crying out saying, God, I want my heart to be broken with what breaks your heart. I want what moves you to move me. I don't want to look at people and just say, well, that's terrible. You know, they're just getting whatever they deserved. Can I say something to you? I'm so thankful that I don't get what I deserve. I'm so thankful with as jacked up as I am that, that God doesn't look at me from heaven and all of a sudden say, okay, you want what you, know, what, what you want other people to have? Well, let it be according to your word. I'm going to tell you something. I pray for mercy, mercy, mercy for my life, for your life, for our community, for our state, and for our nation. We need to ask God in this season, this boomerang season, Father God, so do a deep work inside of us. David cried out, he said, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. You know, Manny Arusso sitting on the back row, and many of you know because you're already a part of Share Your Heart. And, and listen, we've had some growing pains with Share Your Heart. But let me say something to you. Share your heart is our opportunity to reach into the heart of our city and begin to radically see a transformation take place with the glory of God. David's got a training coming up in, 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 in April. So if you want to be a part of that ministry, see David and you can sign up for that. But we've got to be people of compassion. When our Lord and Savior looked at the multitudes, what did it say? He said he had compassion upon them. Well, we're in a season of turnaround right now a double portion. We're in a season where God wants to do some things. Can it start with us? Let me get you to close your eyes. Father, I thank you for your faithfulness. I'm thankful, Father, Lord, for the times that you have foiled demonic plans. Times where the enemy tried to take us out and Father, Lord, you dispatched your angels on our behalf. I'm thankful, Father, Lord, even at times where I was lost as a golf ball in high grass, that you sent people to me to share the truth of the gospel with me. To tell me that you loved me. That you had a plan and a purpose for my life. They didn't judge me. They didn't condemn me. They just told me that you loved me. And I'm thankful, Father God, that you never give up. That, Father, your spirit is constantly drawing. Father, Lord, you have placed us in this capital city to be an influence over this city. To be an influence, Father, over the political leaders that come to this city to legislate. To be an influence, Father, Lord, over this region, over this state, and over this nation. So, Father, we ask this morning that, God, that you would create in us a clean heart. Give us a heart, Father Lord, that beats with you. Give us a heart, Father Lord, that truly wants to see real transformation happen in people. Give us a heart, Father, that never gives up on people. Give us a heart, Father, that never condemns people. Give us a heart, Father Lord, that does not judge people, that doesn't look at the speck in somebody else's eye when we have a plank in our own. Give us a heart, Father God, that truly wants to see the love of God spread abroad inside of our region. Lord, you have us come in contact with people every day that need you. That you've got a plan, Father, for success for their lives. A plan that will blow their mind, blow their family's mind, blow generations to come's mind. And God, you're just looking for people that will share the truth with them. So, Father Lord, you're preparing us for one of the greatest seasons that history will ever record. You've already prophesied it through the prophets. It was Daniel that said that I see people that know God and that will do great exploits in his name. Father, we truly are asking this morning that you help us to know you. May we not know you through the eyes of religion. May we not allow that religious lens to cause hypocrisy to rise up inside of our lives. But may those that we come in contact with know like the disciples that we've been with you. May we not have to tell people that we're a Christian. May our lives reflect it. And Father, we just ask that this morning that God, that you would help us right where we're at. Father, myself included, God, we're all a work in progress, but Father, we want to be so much more. Father, we want to be able to love like never before. We want, to, we want to love our families like never before. We want to love our children like never before. We want to love our employees, our community, our strangers, our neighbors. Father, we just want to be loving because you are a loving God. Father, I just ask, Holy Spirit, close the gap 
between our heart and our head. Confront the areas inside of our minds that are not of you. Father, right now in Jesus' name, I come against every mind-hindering spirit that is lying to your people, that is trying them to get them to be able to settle for something less than your best. Father, I declare and decree that through the power of the Holy Spirit, every lie is being exposed. Every root of bitterness is being plucked up. And every demonic influence is being uncovered. Father, your word says that, Father Lord, you will, Father, um, set the captives free. And so this morning, God, we speak freedom over the lives of your people. Now, Father Lord, on this double Adar, Father, I just ask God that you would fill your people with the joy of the Lord. And that, Father, from this moment forward, Father Lord, we will be your agents of change in the earth. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Well, that was a little bit different than the way I wrote it down to be able to preach it, but I pray it was good to you. Let me say something to you. We got some awesome days ahead. You know what's amazing? We've been reaching out to the community over around the new location that we're coming to, and we have people within a stone's throw of that church that are anxiously waiting for us to open up. Richard's working diligently to get us in that building. And he's telling me without 100% certainty that we will be in that building before December 31st. Listen, I told, I told him, from, from, the, I told him from, from Jump Street, I said, Richard, we're not stressing out over this. We're going to take it every single day and trust God that, that things will fall into place. And it's falling into place. Amen? Keep giving, keep giving. Our, our, our increase is rising a little bit, but you know what? God's faithfully knocking down the, the, the um, overage that we're having to be able to deal with. Other than that, God bless you. See you back this week at Wednesday night. We have Life Group, and look forward to seeing you there.